President Ray Blaine Martin, I don't know what that name is. Uh, I'm sure it's... I've mostly forgotten. Yes. <laughs> and he's a member of the Board of Directors of North Carolina Green Power, and he's also on the uh, Executive Board of the North Carolina Coastal Federation. But, uh, Doug has reviewed many environmental impact statements. He's going to uh, make a few comments about that, and he's going to introduce uh, our next presentation speaker. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for coming. We're glad you're here. Um, yeah, I hit Raleigh traffic. Nasty, nasty rack. I mean, they were out moving for like four minutes. So, um, but it's interesting to me that, that people like uh, Stan uh, talking about inlets uh, frequently say inlets, every inlet is different. No two inlets are the same. You can't tell the same story. But I've been reading environmental impact statements for about 25 years. And in one sense, uh, every environmental impact statement in the coast is the same. Uh, they were initially conceived, the whole process was conceived as something that would really inform people about the risks that they faced uh, uh, with what the government <coughs> was going to do to their resources. Uh, but over time, they, they evolved just into marketing documents. Uh, the the uh, proponents of any project are responsible for hiring the consultants who will then uh, write the report. It comes out with the stamp of the Corps of Engineers on it, but the Corps of Engineers didn't write it. Uh, the consultants wrote it and, and turned it over to the Corps. So there's some things you can depend on. You have to depend on. They make the most optimistic assumptions conceivable. So whatever the benefits are that are listed in the environmental impact statement, reality will be there or lower, probably lower. The costs are always rock bottom. The costs of doing the project will not be any lower than what's in that statement, but they'll probably be higher. Um, how do they deal with uncertainty? Well, two ways. One is inadequately, and the other is not at all. Uh, they don't seem to understand that we don't know what, how many storms we're going to have or how big they're going to be. Um, and, and some other work that I've seen the Corps do, they simply ruled out the possibility of any hurricanes larger than Category 3. Um, well, if that's the world we lived in, then, then these things would be a lot more credible. So they also tend to leave out uh, a lot of the things that are economically important. You know, economics, people think it's all about money, but it's not. Economics is about happiness. Economics is about taking the scarce resources that nature has provided us and trying to generate uh, the maximum, we call it social welfare, but really it's just happiness. Um, and the environmental impact statements never take into account, for instance, the way those beaches are going to look once every four years when they bring the dredging equipment in. Uh, it's ugly, it's nasty, it's, it becomes a dangerous place to walk, you get hard hat areas. Uh, that is a loss of happiness to people who live here or people who want to come down and visit, and that will not enter the environmental impact statement in any, in any way. So there's a lot of things that are economically important that are not financially important uh, that are left out of all of these statements. So again, what, what, you can, what you can believe when you read that statement, and I don't recommend it. Uh, let, let, Jeff Gisler's going to talk to you tonight about the statement, and, and it's good that you read it all, uh, so that you don't have to. Um, but anticipate that the benefits will be lower, and the costs will be higher, and that the uncertainty will be largely ignored. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Andy Coburn. Andy Coburn is the Associate Director of the Program for the Study of Developed Shorelines. And where would that be? Well, of course, at Western Carolina University. That's where the shoreline is. <laughs> uh, used to be in Duke. And then um, when, when did it move in? 2006. 2006, moved it up to the mountains. I guess just so they could get some fresh air and some clean perspectives uh, on and, and some autumn leaves. So Andy's done uh, a lot of different things. He knows as much about uh, beaches and the way they move, the way they have moved uh, around the country and around the world as anybody else uh, there is. He's provided advice to the media. He's provided advice to the Coastal Federation. He's provided uh, advice to, here's a, a list, the NC Hazard Mitigation Planning Initiative, the NC Barrier Island Planning Steering Committee, the NC Coastal Stakeholders Committee, NC State Emergency Response Team, and the list goes on. Um, so he has, he, he will be doing what, what's going to sound like an economic analysis, but really isn't. Uh, it's a fiscal analysis, a financial analysis. In particular, taking a look, a uh, hard look at the tax revenues that are likely to be generated and comparing them with the uh, tax expenditures that we know will be made um, in, in support of this project. 
So without further ado, Andy. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Anthony Goldman, as Doug said. I'm a member of the research and graduate faculty at Western Carolina University. It's kind of cut off there. I'm also an associate director of the program for the study of developed shorelines. Next slide, please. Before I talk about shorelines, let me just tell you a little bit about the program. Uh, we started, as Doug said, we started, um, well, we're Applied Coastal Environmental Management Science Research Center. We started at Duke in 1985 moved to Western Carolina University in 2006. Uh, what we did was to identify and develop responsible science-based coastal management strategies that promote the long-term sustainability of our nation's developed shorelines. And every time I get a talk, give a talk, the first question is, what are you guys doing in the mountains of North Carolina doing coastal management? Well, I used to sit here and explain. I used to take half my talk while I was there. <laughs> OK, that's the response I was looking for. <laughs> I can tell what, 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 what the audience is going to be, but based on the response, I showed this. Um, so we're, we're playing for sea level rise. It's a longer story. If anybody's interested, come talk to me after. I'll tell you why we are where we are. Next slide, please. Um, we study developed shorelines. I, unfortunately, don't get to go to places like this. Where I get to go looks more like this. Which we study with our eyes. Uh, tonight, next slide, please. Obviously here, beautiful Holden <laughs> Beach. I have the pleasure of coming out to the to the coast, not as frequently as I would like to, although this spring, this is my fifth time to the coast. It's a long drive, but it's, it's definitely worth coming. And so why am I here talking to you guys? No, I'm here to talk about the terminal drawing. <laughs> So, why a terminal groin? Okay, we know we're here to talk about terminal groin, but why are we talking about this terminal groin? Next slide, please. Well, this is what the town says in the EIS. The town says um, they're seeking federal and state permits to allow the construction of a 30 year shoreline protection project that serves to mitigate chronic erosion experience along the eastern portion of the town's oceanfront shoreline so as to protect and secure public infrastructure, roads, homes, businesses, beaches recreational assets, and protect the zones. They're going to solve everybody's problem, it sounds like, with this terminal drive. OK, so let's assume, <laughs> so let's assume that this is a, a given. This is what they want to do with this terminal drive. Right? So this is multiple objectives. So this is their goal, what you see in red. So the first thing we're going to look at is the cost. As Doug said, there are costs buried in EIS. Let me see a show of hands of how many people read this EIS. The whole thing, including the appendix. The appendices. <laughs> okay. Like Doug said, I've been reading the EIS and the EAs for almost as long as Doug, maybe longer. Um, so I've seen it all. Okay, and Doug is right. Costs are in there and they're different everywhere you look. Uh, you can ask 100 people what the cost of this terminal groin is going to be, you're going to get 100 different answers. And the reason for that is because nobody knows what this is going to cost over the 30-year planning horizon, which is what the, uh, the engineers use as a 30 years into the future. But we have a relatively decent idea based on historical or other projects that have occurred. And so what I did is I went back and looked at an estimate of what I thought the costs would be over the next 30 years. So you can see here, time zero is the initial construction of this groin. $5 million, and the estimates are that it'll, 150,000 cubic yards will have to be in place while the, while the groin is built. And this is the groin we're looking at right now. This is the, the, uh, the intermediate groin, which is uh, number six, I believe it's option six. <clears throat> so some of the estimates are that the uh, groin construction and the fillet, it's not a fillet, it's called a fillet, will cost $5 million at time zero. And then every four years will be required will be nourishment, you see here. And then what I did was I used a discount rate of 0.3 or 3%, price appreciation rate of 5%, boom, plugged it in, and I get a net present value of about $27.5 million over 30 years. That's the cost of this growing, including nourishment. That doesn't include maintenance. That doesn't include legal action, if there is any, if, if somebody has a lawsuit based on uh, the result of this growing. Um, it doesn't include any unforeseen events. This is just straightforward nourishment and growing construction. So we're looking at net present value of about 27, which I believe fits into what the EIF says. 
Now, there's a range here and it fits right in there. Now, I didn't base this on the EIS because I didn't read this EIS because I don't have to. I know what this EIS says. I've read, like I said, I've read plenty of EIS and EAs in my life. I have stacks of them on my desk. Some of them are in this bag. Right? And I've read them. I've read them. I've read every word. This one I didn't have to read. I went through it. I know what it says. And this is the number I got. And it's right there in line. Next slide, please. What is this terminal we're going to get? Oh, this is the hard part. This is the difficult part. Costs we can figure out. They may be wrong, but we can figure them out. Right? So what is this terminal growing getting you? Why, do you why, did, why, why does whoever want this terminal growing? What is the reason for it? So before we can talk about the benefits of what this terminal growing may or may not provide, uh, I'm going to have, unfortunately, a series of uh, slides with a bunch of text on them. I don't typically have slides with text on them, but this is an informational session. And so I figured um, my class, when I teach my class at night, right around this time when I see everybody start yawning, I would dare put text up there. But I think you guys can tell with that, so be fair with me. Um, so anyway, uh, coastal ecosystems provide a variety of goods and services that create real economic value via contributions to human well-being. Uh, <coughs> these include the protection of coastal real estate tourism, as well as some of these other non-services um, uh, and non-market goods, such as aesthetics, habitat protection, habitat provision, and opportunities for recreation. Uh, quantifying the associated benefits to people from these goods and services is a domain of economic valuation. So pay attention to these uh, phrases that are read. Uh, protection of coastal real estate and tourism and quantifying the associated benefits to people. Next slide, please. The Army Corps of Engineers, when they do a, a, a cost-benefit analysis for a shore protection project or a coastal protection structure, uses what's called the damage avoidance approach. And what this means is that they ascribe estimates of cost to notions of value. And what that means is the cost of replacing coastal property is used to estimate the benefits derived from activities that protect that property. And so while this approach may seem logical from a property owner's perspective, uh, value does not provide an accurate means of understanding derived benefits. Next slide, please. Um, so economic valuation, in our opinion, doesn't work. Okay, well, it does work, but it isn't fair to use. And here's why. You see the two reasons why. The value of property accrues almost exclusively to the property owner. And coastal property values are inflated, are often inflated. Along North Carolina Coast, just about all property values are inflated where there's been a public policy or a prior public action that has supported the value of that property. Um, so as a result, economic value is the effect. An over-evaluation of vulnerable coastal development, an exaggeration of potential economic impacts to municipalities and counties resulting from property damage or loss, an overstatement of potential negative impacts, the negative economic impacts associated with property loss, and an inflated perception of the economic benefits of shoreline protection efforts. Next slide. So as a result, uh, the use of coastal property value as an estimate for the benefits of a shoreline stabilization project often leads to the conclusion that highly developed beaches are worth more than undeveloped beaches, or in the case of a terminal groin, <coughs> the benefits of protecting development exceed the cost. But from a public or societal perspective, which might include homeowner association, uh, the community, the state, the county, the country as a whole, uh, the opposite is almost always true. Next slide, please. Uh, this is my last text slide. But anyway, this is important. This is, this is, this is what we believe in the program for the study of shorelines, is that a more accurate way to measure how much coastal development at risk to shipping inlets, which is what we're looking at here in the East End of Holden Beach, uh, how much of that is worth to society or the public is the contribution that this development makes to municipal, county, and state economies measured by the ad valorem occupancy and sales tax revenue they generate. Subsequently, from a public policy perspective, measuring changes in tax revenue generated, a tax revenue generated um, from actions that seek to protect or remove at-risk scopes of development represents a more pragmatic tool for assessing public costs and potential public benefits of shoreline protection strategies such as the of line. Next slide. 2011, after the state uh, commissioned a study in 2010 to look at terminal groins and the feasibility and efficacy of terminal groins, we sat around the office and said, you know, what is wrong with this study? There's something just not right. Okay, all these communities have, they, they claim that they're so important to the economy of the state, and they're so important to the economy of the country, and yet they are never able to do anything. And it dawned on us that 
instead of looking at value of property, for, let's look at what these properties produce, which is what I said is a combination of tax revenue. So we did a fiscal analysis of all, all the developed inlets in North Carolina in 2011. And this is a white paper that we produced, and some of you may have seen this. This is based on, next slide please. This is the study that the state commissioned. Uh, this is the study of terminal reliance, and just basically concluded that they couldn't make a conclusion. They could not determine whether terminal reliance should or should not be allowed. Next, next slide. What I did was, I went into our white paper from, from five years ago, and compared it and updated it. So the top image here you see is taken from the, the state's terminal reliance study done in 2010, and this is an image from 2016. And so some of the things I want to point out, because you're going to see these images again, is this yellow line is called a 30-year risk line. And this line was delineated by the North Carolina Coastal Science Panel, which is a collection of some of the states or some of the countries, maybe in the world's uh, most knowledgeable and most preeminent coastal scientists and coastal engineers, of which Stan is a member. And they drew this line, they looked at these inlets, and they said, where on these islands is there a potential for each inlet to impact over the next 30 years? And again, I'm using the 30-year plan for that. And so on, on all the islands, they drew these lines. And anything, I've been <coughs> sorry, okay. um, and anything that is on seaward side of the yellow line has the potential to be impacted by something that this inlet, and here's lots of following that, something that this inlet might do over 30 years. Doesn't mean it's going to be impacted, but the best guess and the best science tells them that they think that this is the zone in which there may be an impact in the next 30 years. So what I did is I superimposed this line on today's aerial photograph, and that's what you'll see here. Okay, next slide. So then we have all our, all our, our, our figures um, that we used to do this fiscal analysis. <coughs> and, and so what you see here is um, the, the current tax base, the tax rate, the property tax revenue for Holden Beach, and the same thing for County, for Brunswick County. And then we, did, we calculated what the, the uh, Holton Beach accommodation tax revenue is and for the county, and then sales tax revenue and also for the county. Okay, so here's these numbers. And I went back to what the state did in 2010 and updated the numbers. So I basically noticed that there was very little change in development on this side of the, uh, the risk line, actually, you can hit it. So what we're doing is looking at anything that's in red right now. So the state determined, or the, the contractor for the state, and the state approved this, said that within this red area, on the east end of Holden Beach, there are 150 properties that are considered at risk. Uh, they have an assessed value of 14.627 million, which represents 1.23% of, of the town's tax base. So all the properties in the red represent 1.23% of Holden Beach tax base. They also represent 0.06% of the county's tax base. The total annual tax revenue generated by all the properties that you well, would have seen if the red wasn't here, and that includes property tax, sales tax, and occupancy tax, is right around one hundred twenty-eight and a half million, one hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars. The net present value of that tax revenue over the next thirty years is about five point two six million dollars. A terminal groin, if it's built and if it does exactly what it's supposed to do, which it won't, but even if it did. It's not going to do anything for all 150 properties. That terminal groin may do is protect the properties that are right out here that are considered an imminent risk. And so you can see the state has a definition of imminent risk. And what you'll see here is these little triangles show you properties that have sandbags. So these are properties that have sandbags in front of them in 2010. And these are properties that have sandbags in them, according to the Division of Coastal Management, GIS, as of yesterday, are here. Now, this may or may not be the case right now. <coughs> so, from our perspective, and from a lot of other coastal geologists, think that a terminal groin, if it's going to do, provide any benefits, it's going to provide benefits to the most imminently threatened properties, which are right here. And according to the state, there are 32 of those. Those 32 have an assessed value of about $3 million which represents 0.26% of the town's tax base and 0.014% of the county's tax base. All these properties, these 32 properties, produce a total annual tax revenue of about $27,000. of property tax, sales tax, occupancy tax. Net present value of that tax, of, of this annual tax, 
revenue over 30 years is about $1.15 million. Next slide. All the properties on this side of the risk line and the properties which are imminent risk, which are the ones that are sandbagged, and actually I think there's a little more of them, that may benefit from this, from this terminal growing. <clears throat> so you can see a comparison that this would be uh, the best case scenario, I guess you could say. This is the probabilistic scenario. It's still the best case scenario. But you can see that there's a vast difference between the revenue that would be lost if these properties went away versus the properties that are going to benefit from the terminal growing if they do benefit. So there's the summary. So the net, the net present value cost of the building from we're going estimated, I estimated about 27 million. It could be more, it won't be less. The net present value of the tax revenue protected of uh, the properties that stand to potentially benefit, uh, 1.15 million. Net present value of all tax revenue protected of every property that you saw in that red area that is about five million. So you can, here's a good way to compare what we think are the public costs and the public benefits. Right. I summarized my white paper that a fiscal analysis of 15 North Carolina coastal Canada communities showed us the following. That the contribution um, of at-risk coastal development makes to North Carolina coastal economies is minor. The impact of losing properties at risk to shipping inlets is less than perceived, or we can define it as inconsequential. And three, a strategic and equitable policy that proactively removes vulnerable development is likely to be the most economically and environmentally sustainable. So public policies and management strategies, this is going to uh, echo what Stan just told you. That policies and strategies that can overcome common economic misperceptions provide property owners, state and local policymakers, and managers with a sustainable and equitable strategy that currently addresses economic, environmental, legal, political problems and issues facing the nation's shorelines. So in summary, um, in order to assess the fairness and efficacy of a publicly funded shore protection project, such as the terminal growing or beach nourishment, uh, it's critical to identify the societal benefits as well as the primary beneficiaries of that project. Only then can the following questions be answered. I think these are some of the questions that you're asking. Is, is this project really worth doing? Is there something else that might work better? And three, who should pay for whatever is eventually done? Next slide. Please. 